conference gathers experts on Uyghur genocide to put pressure on China. So yay to putting pressure on China. From September 1st to 3rd, um, the biggest gathering of politicians and legal and academic experts on Xinjiang gathered in the Boiler House at Newcastle University in the United Kingdom. Dr. Joe Smith Finley, who organized this gathering, has been researching, quote, the evolution of identities among the Uyghurs in, of Xinjiang, Northwest China, and the Uyghur diaspora, among others. Quote, we are gathering all these people to combine their expertise and influence to up the ante to inc increase pressure on China, explained Dr. Finley. The three-day conference included in-person and virtual panel discussions. It aimed to discuss the matter of China's increasingly volatile region of Xinjiang and the Chinese Communist Party's oppression of the ethnic Uyghur Muslim population. China has vehemently denied any of these accusation, accusations despite mounting evidence. Dr. Finley stated that starting with the upcoming Winter Olympics in Beijing, the international community must hold China accountable, adding, quote, there's a lot we can do in terms of shaming. Shaming? I don't think, wait, wait, is that the highlight? Because I don't know if shaming is going to be enough. Shame. Are they going to like ring bells at like the shame <laughs> bell? The Game of Thrones shame? Like, are they going to be like, like, I don't, um, I'm trying to not be pessimistic here. Okay. Because I mean, a lot of people are like, oh, this is nothing. But I mean, at the end of the day, for you to start something is like, it's, it's academic and politicians, right? So, I mean, that's how you're supposed to, like, you can't just come up with plans willy nilly. You do need, some people to come and study and come up with, you know, very evidence-based methods of actually coming up, you know, coming up with solutions to pressure China, like based on things that we can tell based on historical records and statistics and stuff that works. However, is the conclusion really just shaming? Like, what is it like? Oh, first of all, I, like, I can't judge how good this is. Uh, because I don't know which academics are these like actual good academics or like just some who are the academics, what are their sources of funding, who, you know, academics from where, you know, what are their credentials, and then the politicians, what kind of politicians are we talking, politicians from what countries, and at, at what level of authority, do you know what I mean, like who are mm -hmm. these politicians, what country are we talking, what countries are we talking about? Um. Wait, I can find you more. Um, is that really? Is second. that really the only thing? Like, uh, have they talked? Have they talked about anything other than shaming? Because that's not really gonna. I mean, yes, that was just like one specific quote. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um. So the three-day conference was attended by very specialized individuals who um, included uh, scholars. Um, uh, who, who were uh, Uyghur scholars or from Xinjiang, experts in international laws and genocide, right. non-government or uh, organization representatives, human rights advocates, activists, think tanks, and politicians from the UK. Okay, good. Okay, okay, okay. All right, guys, I know this, it's, th this thing, I'm trying not to be pessimistic, okay? I know this by itself is like, oh, this is not going to do anything. You guys are just holding a conference and talking. But I think, like, I don't you do need like for somebody to put out you know something out there a roadmap right like if you need something out there you need some um declare you know people to talk to each other and put out a roadmap for anybody who if there any if there is going to be a pressure on china it better be based on people that have access to da data and the experience and the know-how to show what is the best way of doing this, right? Like this, this by itself is not going to do anything, but if there is going to be anything done, if it's good that these things exist, so there's something you could refer to at least to, to take action, right? Like, I mean, this is like, we just came out of the anniversary of nine 11. We all seen that when countries just take actions willy nilly without talking, without having experts coming out and be like, I don't think this is going to pan out the way you think it does. Maybe hold on. Maybe don't take action too hastily. Like it's 
good for these, you know, I, I know a lot of people dismiss these kind of conferences or people getting together and talking about what to do as if it's like, this is not going to do anything. While at the same time, the people who might criticize conferences like this are, are the same people who will criticize politicians for taking actions without actually doing the studies and having the experts involved, right? So this is having the experts involved. I'm not saying this by itself is going to do anything, but if there are going to be any actions taken, it's good that we have something like things like this happening. So at least the roadmap does exist. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, it's not like I don't think any of us are under the impression that like one conference in China is like, oh, shoot, you got me. But the function <laughs> of a conference is <laughs> more to yeah. actually bring people together from um, a diversity of disciplines to actually meet face to face, build new networks, exchange ideas and mm. um, consolidate efforts, right? That's where the real strength of it lies to help keep people informed, educated, and actually um, hopefully create more collective power. And building connections, right? Yeah. Like for example, like you might have this politician that may, might f meet this human rights activist and this academic during the conference and I'm like, oh my God, yes. And then they exchange contacts and then there's going to be like their connection together might build, turn into something uh, good. You know what I mean? Or not, I don't know, but you have to try. Like it's better to have these things than not having these things, right? And the guys, mm -hmm. there has to be an alternative to, you know, these are, you know, a lot of people, you, when you go to war with other countries over like human rights, people are like, oh, wow, great. You caused something that was much worse than the thing that you needed to solve, right? And then when you do nothing, right? People are like, oh, wait, great. What happened to never forget, never forget? What happened to human rights? Oh, look, the world is standing by and doing nothing as human rights are being violated, right? So you can't do like outright war and you can't do nothing when human rights are being violated, okay? So what's, what's, what's left in between? What's left in between is extremely complicated and figuring out how to press, how to promote human rights without promoting war and without doing nothing then involves a lot of studies and a lot of analysis because the thing the thing that works that is in the middle it's so complicated like and there's it's very hard to figure out where in between all the two extremes you want to be right so and you need you need stuff like this to figure that out this is not an easy easy you know a lot of people sit back and are like Oh, solve it like this, solve it like this, as if as if it's as if it's that simple, right? As soon as you get involved, you realize that everything you pull, everything you touch is going to have so many domino effects on so many other things. And you have to consider all the side effects of everything you do before you actually do something, right? When it comes to international politics, um, everything you do will have benefits and harm, right? And the people who are against it will highlight the harms, the people who are for it are hi highlighting the benefits. There's and doing nothing is also has harms um, and there's benefits to doing nothing and there's also harm associated with doing, uh, doing anything. Um, so the challenge is to the cost benefit analysis to doing anything or doing nothing, it's much more complicated than most people understand, right? People just like judge things like, oh, this was a good decision, this was a bad decision. As if it, in hindsight, with the power of hindsight, they think like the politicians or the academics should have just seen it coming, but they're like judging it after it happens and they think like they're smart because they could, they would have seen it coming if they were in the position, which they, they wouldn't have. So they're, you know, anyways, it takes more, it takes more stuff like this to figure these things out. Um, oh shoot. There was something else I was going to say. Wait, there was a quote. So there, there's um, a quote that I want to read from the Associated Press. Um, so the United States, uh, so to just kind of fill you guys in on some of the actions, uh, some more substantive actions taken against uh, China, the United States has blocked imports of cotton and tomatoes from Xinjiang and companies linked to forced labor in the region. And um, in the European Union and Britain have also imposed sanctions on Communist Party officials. Despite such moves and a growing body of evidence documenting abuses, critics say that there has not been enough international pol uh, political or legal action. It is still unclear if the economic sanctions would compel Beijing or Chinese companies to change their ways. 
China has also retaliated by imposing sanctions on Western individuals and institutions and called for boycotts against leading retailers such as Nike and H&M after they expressed concerns about forced labor in Xinjiang. Finley, the conference organizers, was one of several British individuals slapped with Chinese sanctions and banned from visiting China earlier this year for her academic work. Hmm. Um, Zakuru is saying the strongest message we can send China is boycotting the 2022 Winter Olympics at Beijing. Yeah, and also, by the way, something that um, a lot of people are trying to study when it comes to sanctions, right? Because we have, again, we have war, we have economic sanctions, and then we have doing nothing, right? Um, the problem, you know, people, most people don't want war. A lot of, most, a lot, most people also don't want not doing nothing because doing nothing means like just accepting human rights violation. Uh, but so a lot of people look at economic sanctions and other form of like boycott or sanctions. And the problem with sanctions is that a lot of people who are not guilty get harmed, right? So this is the only tool, the only weapon that a lot of people think that we have other than war and doing nothing. Sanctions is the only form of pressure that we could put on countries who are not respecting human rights. Uh, and then you look at sanctions and you're like, okay, sanctions harms a lot of innocent people. So a lot of people are trying to, you know, financial experts, economic experts, and so many other academics are trying to come up with sanctions that are more targeted uh, to a certain group and r reduces uh, collateral damage on uh, you know s individuals who are not guilty. So those are that's a and it's getting better and better. Um, like th there are s some very creative ways that people are coming up with new methods of sanctions that would reduce the economic harm on people who don't deserve it. Again, but I don't know how far we've got. I've seen some people claiming that um, they have made a lot of progress in that, but we'll see. Um, do you, should we read any, is there anything you want to read in the live chat or any other comments while I get the next news? Um, no, I think Sakura brings up a very good point regarding, um, boycotting the Olympics. Um, there has been a lot of calls by both Uyghur and Tibetan activists to boycott the elections. Um, their uh, AGI saying companies or countries could refuse to compete in the 22, 20, 2022 Winter Olympics. I don't know how likely that is. I think individual athletes are more likely to refuse to compete. But even that's difficult because that's the pinnacle of someone's career, right? Um, so that's a major personal cost to them for what ultimately might not get that much attention or let's be honest, it's also kind of marketing for them as well. Like they might not get as much attention for doing that as would make it worth it. So it's really difficult. I don't think um, there are going to be very many countries, if any, that refuse to compete in the uh, 2022 Olympics because um the Olympics is one of the best marketing strategies that countries have, period. Like, uh, that's why, like, Russia and China are so obsessive about the athletes that they train their entire lives to specifically to perform and get gold medals because it's it's marketing for their countries and the strength of their countries. And then subsequently, the strength of the ideologies that their countries um, have bought into or promote. Um, so ask, yeah, uh, yeah, I don't, I'm not holding out to see that that happens. Um, very good points, by the way, thank you for music and music guys reminding everybody who's watching to like, like the video. Thank you, music guy. Yes, please, please. Everybody like, so that it helps our um, channel grow. So please like the video. If, uh, if you're watching, it doesn't cost you anything and it helps us. Um, Zakura, I'm not going to highlight that because talking about certain blockchains might like encourage people to look into it and people will make it, you know, make me, and if it's, if they lose money, then they're going to blame us. And I know, I know it's relevant to what we're talking about, but I'm still not going to highlight it. Uh, Qasim is saying sanctions should aim directly 
at companies that use eager products um, at like for at like Nike, Puma, Zara, Adidas, etc. Yeah, I think that's a that's yeah. What do you think? That's why it's kind yeah. of funny that China like slapped um, Nike and H and M on the wrist with sanctions after they expressed concerns about forced labor because Nike and H and M are notorious for bad labor practices. <laughs> Um, and Nike specifically, I'm not sure about H&M off the top of my head, um, has been implicated in using cotton that was from a forced labor supply chain in their products. So it's a little, it's pretty Yeah, it's, it's very... A Apple it's, is also like in that whole gang as well. It's very ironic from uh, that like some BLM activists, you know, for example, get involved with Nike to um promote you know you know f to to fight against anti-black discrimination in united states you know given the history of slavery in united states you would think that you wouldn't get in bed with nike given that they're actually using <laughs> modern <laughs> you know they're using slavery right now to make their products in, you know, currently they're using slavery and y y the, the history of black, uh, black people in America uh, has been a highlight of that. It has been their experience with slavery. And now you're getting involved. Oh, like, oh yeah, Nike, let's get in bed with each other to promote anti-black discrimination no, while no, they're to, going through. Not to promote it, to no, fight to against promote, it. To promote awareness of anti-black awareness of anti-black discrimination while they're actually involved in promoting slavery somewhere else like it's just i don't know i just i, I don't know what I, I don't know what the judgment on that is going to be but it's just ironic i don't know yeah a but lot that, of people I, have pointed that out it's yeah? uh yeah the that irony isn't lost, lost on them. many people yeah i don't know maybe like somebody could justify it by, as saying like yeah, that's an, that's someone else's activism. I get whatever I can to bring attention to my brand of activism. So maybe that's a justification for it. Like, you know what? Mm -hmm. Like, okay, that's bad. Somebody do that activism. I'm focusing on this. And whatever allies I could get to bring attention to this, I'll take it. I'm just... Well, I mean, it just really highlights out. that um, Nike taking up Colin Kaepernick in particular as this icon for their like ostensibly like anti uh anti-black racism campaigns that it's it's marketing it's not sincere at the very least i think like we could all agree on that yeah but like an activist might say like i know it's not sincere um i don't care but we'll if take I what can, we can get we could we'll take what we can get right i guess this is what brings attention to the cause that i care about so be it you know you know, I'm just I'm just doing a devil's advocate on this one, just mm. to not just promote one side. Oh. Hey guys, if you're a fan of blasphemy and sexy Cali, you know, like me, then you need to be sure to subscribe to our newsletter. Link in the description below. Because if you subscribe, we will send you a free copy of our Blasphemous Art ebook. And let me tell you, it is the tastiest blasphemy that you can find anywhere available today. And we are so generous with our blasphemy that we continue to send you more blasphemy every week. So make sure to subscribe. Link in the description below.